Welcome to Conversations. I'm Muqtadar Khan, your host. And today, as you can see, I have with me Ambassador Sayyid Akbaruddin, who is currently the Dean of uh, Kautilya School of Public Policy in Hyderabad, India. Uh, for those of you who know, Hyderabad is my hometown. Uh, and they say you can take the Hyderabadi out of Hyderabad, but you can't take the biryani out of the Hyderabadi. <laughs> so I still have a lot of uh, cultural attachments to Hyderabad. Uh, uh, Ambassador Akbaruddin uh, has served as India's permanent representative to the United Nations. He also was a spokesperson for the Ministry of External Affairs. And uh, there are, if you do a Google search on him, you'll find that at one point he was the most popular <laughs> and most beloved bureaucrat in the Indian Foreign Service. So thank you for your service uh, and, for, and congratulations on such a uh, distinguished career ambassador. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Khan, for that gracious introduction. Um, and um, I'm grateful to you for providing me an opportunity to engage with you and through you to the large audience that you always command on your show. Thank you very much. We are going to talk about uh, the book that uh, the ebook that we have just published from the New Lines Institute. It is called Rise of India as a World Power, in which uh, Ambassador Akbaruddin has contributed a chapter uh, titled The Long Road to UN Security Council, India's Long Road to UN Security Council Reform. Uh, I was surprised after reading your chapter that India has been seeking to reform the UN Security Council even before India became independent. So they've been trying since 1945. Uh, why is the UN Security Council reform so much important to India, sir? So uh, Dr. Khan, uh, India, even prior to in its independence, had a view of itself. It viewed itself as an aspirational state, a state which would play a role of significance in global affairs because India felt that its independence is start of a change in global affairs uh, with the numbers of uh, uh, Indians uh, populating the land uh, with the heritage and with the potential of being a aspirational power. India felt that it's destined. So you're right that Prior to independence, since independence, India has been, the quest is an endless quest for India. Um, but that doesn't mean very much. We are a civilizational state in the sense that we look at uh, these things in a long term. So you can say it's been a long game for India, a rather long game, but it's a game that India has always felt that it will achieve at some stage. It took 200 years for India to gain its independence from the British. We are still quite some time in, in, in terms of time period to achieve a goal which we think is where our rightful place is. So I was looking at the arguments that were made early on. In the early on, the arguments made when India was one of the NAM leaders, uh, the non-aligned movements leaders, etc., especially when the Security Council was expanded to reach uh, the non-permanent members were expanded from 6 to 10. So the argument used to be a equitable representation. You know, So they're talking about essentially regional representation. There should be enough representation from Africa, Latin America, etc., but lately, the argument seems to be that the world has significantly changed and the UN Security Council and other multilateral institutions like the IMF and the World Bank do not reflect contemporary realities. Uh, so that is the current argument that there, things have changed. What has changed? That What does India claim has changed uh, that necessitates uh, the UN Security Council and other multilateral institutional reforms? So it's normal to think that in 70 years, the world has changed. The challenges that the world faces have changed. Uh, so if you look at 1945, what were the challenges? Decolonization, um, uh, um, racial discrimination, uh, quest for equality. These were the broad challenges that uh, uh, new countries faced. Uh, India was the leader in decolonization. India's uh, decolonization actually set the trend. And uh, today the UN has more than 80 countries who 
have through various processes achieved their independence. So that issue is a um, record in history that it's done. Um, India was again the first country to raise the issue of apartheid at the UN. It wasn't any other country which talked of um, apartheid being a, a total denial of human rights. That issue since has settled. So while we still talk of equitable, equitable now means a different thing that there are new challenges. These challenges are, for example, climate change, for example, uh, global debt, for example, artificial intelligence. And today, what uh, the UN and all its organs were set up in the name of we the people. We the people is also the start of the Indian constitution. So you can't say that you would like to have democracy at home for those who promote democracy at home and promote it among states to say that global governance is not going to be democratic. So that has changed. Uh, and India's uh, argument is that uh, nothing about us without us being involved. After all, India represents a sixth of humanity. Today, the population of India is more than the population of, um, if you leave China out, all the Security Council members together. So much has changed. Geopolitics has changed. Hard power has changed. Soft power has changed. And India feels now that in any global decision, it is a significant player. So you can't take decisions about uh, one sixth of humanity without having some form of representation. And that's what has changed. The challenges have changed. And these challenges can only be met through a collaborative effort. Collaboration requires a place at the table. Sir, sir what is interesting is that I mean, I think the argument that the UN unfortunately probably will listen to more is that there has been significant shift in balance of power with India soon going to become the third biggest economy. And for the last 25 years, it has been a nuclear power and there are only nine of them. So yes, there is a significant difference in hard power truly. And, and with India projecting itself as a visual guru, as you argue, that India has become far more important country. But I, I went and, you know, I, I, I actually watched the conference that um, Dr. Jay Shankar hosted at the UN Security Council for, I forget the complex name that they had, multilateral reform, uh, et cetera, in the last few weeks of India's presidency of the UN Security Council. And uh, what I realized from there was that all the permanent members except China uh, seem to before UN Security Council reform. And I went back and looked, and they've been saying this for like half a century that, yes, we need to reform. Uh, but there's no concrete process, actually. So, like, why why isn't there a process if, if there is a broad consensus that there is need for reform? Why isn't there any movement on that? So you've touched at a very critical uh, issue. Um, the issue is that in reality, none of the permanent members are going to do the heavy lifting in this, uh, uh, in this issue because they all feel that their status has to be preserved. Now, they want that status to be preserved in total. UN Security Council reform is stuck not only because of a non-agreement about who could be the new uh, permanent members, but the issue of the veto. And that's where the permanent members are concerned that any further movement down this path will inevitably, in the final instance, involve some give on the veto. Because it's not about consensus. There are 190 countries, perhaps, or 187 or 185, mm -hmm. who will say, all right, let's have a diminution of the um, uh, uh, power of the veto of these five countries. And th so, therefore, there is a reluctance on their part, which is understandable. That's how uh, politics is played on the global stage. So, India doesn't expect all of them to do anything. The Chinese 
have been less nuanced and more direct in their uh, view, saying that the time is not appropriate. They are looking at a long-term uh, uh, arrangement whereby their interests are uh, um, uh, covered in other ways. In other ways, and as as I mentioned to you at the beginning, India is in this for the long term. So this is all right. If global governance is to succeed, there is no way it can succeed without India. So unlike some other aspirants who feel that as time passes, their uh, ability to be on the council are going to be circumscribed. India doesn't see that. India sees time as a factor in strengthening its case. And that's what we've seen in our lifetime. Nobody took India seriously as a permanent member in the 50s, including our own leadership, perhaps. We didn't think we were ready for it. Today, we think that the time is much more opportune than it was some time ago. Whereas several other countries are in a hurry for this because they feel that they are at the cusp or the crest of their power, and then there may be a diminution in theirs. So uh, we feel that if global governance has to succeed, India will have to be included. So by that count, we are a little bit more uh, patient, understanding of the situation than pushing for it in the manner some others are doing. So uh, the names that are often floated around is called the G4, for example. The argument is that Germany, Japan, India and Brazil are the ones who enjoy the support of the permanent members, more or less, basically when they are saying support, we're talking about Britain, France, and US who seem to at least provide lip service uh, on this issue. Even President Biden has talked about expansion of the Security Council uh, and then G4. But we'll talk about the G4 in a moment, but I want to ask you this question. Why has no one opened the Pandora's box and ask the question, do Britain and France still deserve to be permanent members in the UN Security Council uh, and uh, exercising veto? I mean, they are lackeys of the United States, it's like giving the US three vetoes. So um, that has been asked in an indirect manner by the Russian Federation. Russia's view is that India and Brazil certainly do um, uh, can be uh, looked at as potential permanent members. But they don't think Europe needs another permanent member. They think Europe is already overrepresented because even if you take by the numbers, there are a total of about 28 countries in what is called the Western Europe and others group. The Asian group has, Asia Pacific group has something like 53 members. Um, the African group has 54 members. So you can see the numbers are clearly weighted against some of the permanent members and maybe that's their reluctance not to push this further because at some stage there are going to be challenges for them especially when some time ago there was a talk of a common european foreign policy now you can't have a common european foreign policy and decide to have more and more european union members together there so uh, we do understand that serious national interests are uh, concerned and therefore, states will not push it. It is up to us to push that. Uh, and we understand that it will happen. Uh, we are confident that it will take time, but we are not in a hurry. Again, as I said, starting by, we are looking at the long term. We see every year as adding to India's credentials, not uh, diminishing them. So uh, G4 is a tactical alliance between countries of uh, diverse um, uh, regions wanting to push their case and there are countries who have opposed individuals. India has not been opposed by anybody except as you rightly pointed out, China has not supported anybody, uh, not a single state. Perhaps they don't even want a uh, expansion uh, and are pretty uh, vociferous about that. Whereas the others are perhaps a bit more nuanced because they realize if somebody has to do the dirty work, let the Chinese do the dirty work, not them. So I don't understand why Brazil is considered. Is it because of a, like a quota system that we need to have a Latin American country? And then that raises the issue of Africa. And uh, I'm, I was quite surprised to know that 
Africa is kind of a spoiler on this issue, isn't it? Uh, demanding uh, two two seats and not designating who. What? How do you understand this 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 role of Africa on Security Council reform? So um, the UN is based on regional groups. Um, and so let me just make out uh, the historical background to Brazil. Okay. Brazil was at a certain stage considered to be the fifth member and it was not France, but Brazil because Brazil had also been a regular member of the League of Nations. In fact, it withdrew from the League of Nations when it was not made a permanent representative at the League of Nations uh, at that stage. So Brazil's case is um, uh, it's been a long time in the making. Uh, it is the largest Latin American country by far. And therefore, if equitable geographical representation is the basis, Brazil has a case. Uh, and so that's Brazil's case. That said, as you said, the challenge is Africa. And th that challenge has actually been compounded as Africa's ties with China have increased. Africa has become more reticent. Uh, in right now putting forward even a candidate because Africa's case has always been give us the two seats we will then decide the candidates among ourselves and then you can vote for those candidates now nobody is going everybody is going to look at a candidate before they even yeah. apportion this so uh, it's a challenge uh, for Africa and the Chinese have played it well by playing on this African hesitancy. Africa is unique in many respects because it has a African Union. It has a, um, a system whereby they are trying to work out themselves, not with much success, but they are trying to. India's case is sui generis. It has nothing to do with anybody else's case. Its case is that we are a billion plus people. If you want global governance to be democratized, you cannot ignore a country with 1.4 billion people and that's it. Uh, some of you may like India, some of you may have other issues with India, does not matter. In terms of hard power, India has a role to play in terms of soft power too. I did read your article where you thought that India was not contributing very much. I would beg to differ, but I will leave that discussion for a later day. Uh, but uh, for now, I would say that there is a strong case and everybody acknowledges it. Um, if there was a straight vote, India would get through. But it's not only about India. I mentioned to you about um, the veto. Africa has a uh, difficult issue because even with two, if you read some of the fine print in the African language, it is at least two. Because yeah. at every given number, there will be another uh, contender. So originally it started with one, but then Nigeria and South Africa couldn't work it out. So they said, Two and then Egypt, which is North African but African in terms of the continent, felt why two? Why doesn't Egypt have a right? Because it has a civilizational heritage, it's contributed in many ways, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they put in the caveat at least two. In the Egyptian mind, it doesn't mean two; it means two plus. So we will get down to this all the time. The moment you have Egypt, you will have another country. It's yeah. the same that was the case between India and Pakistan in the 1970s, 80s, 90s. Pakistan at one time even announced that they would be a candidate and we were very re ready for it. Today, nobody takes Pakistan as a serious candidate. Therefore, their uh, approach is let's not have the expansion rather than have an expansion and be ready to contest against India because times have changed. Yeah, you, you know, the your reference to Pakistan is interesting because you write about uh, a set of middle powers, you know, like Mexico and Argentina and Indonesia, who are actually against expansion. So I can understand what Pakistan is trying to do. It sees uh, if, it's, if UN Security Council is expanded, you will immediately have India probably the first choice uh, to get in there. If there's going to be one change, it could most probably will be India. Uh, and India probably will also now with Quad get Japanese support and maybe even German support. Uh, and maybe through BRICS, even Brazil support. But uh, I don't understand why countries like Indonesia and, and uh, others are opposed to uh, expansion of the UN Security Council. 
So in international relations, what you see depends on where you are. Yeah. So it's pretty it's pretty obvious that there is not going to be more than one developing country in Asia who will get through, even by all accounts, or maybe only one developing country, as you said. So Indonesia knows that, yes, it's an important country. Yes, it's a populous country. Yes, it's a rapidly industrializing country. But if you put India and Indonesia on the same pedestal, the Indonesians know where they stand. It's understandable. Uh, uh, so I wouldn't grudge Indonesia. Indonesia started by initially saying they were for expansion of both categories. The only argument was why not two from Asia? But they realized very quickly that's a non-starter uh, because nobody is going to uh, have such an expanded security council with two from Asia. So what's the other choice? The other choice is to say, well, why not expand it by, say, 10 middle powers, all of them getting a rotation chance and Asia would get more than one. So if it gets three, Japan, India and maybe Indonesia. Pakistan would say, I want four for Asia because maybe Japan, um, uh, India, Indonesia, and maybe Pakistan or somebody else, Saudi Arabia uh, may have a case again. So this will continue where you stand will be, uh, because they know they have no case for a permanent membership at the situation they are located in. So does Canada. And to be fair, these are countries like Spain, Italy, Canada, they all have contributed to the UN and they have contributed substantively in terms of resources, in terms of thought, in terms of ideas and the general goal of multilateralism. Some of those countries have done well and they see that somebody or some of their equals are moving up. So crabs always pull other crabs down. <laughs> That's an interesting point. Uh, one of the discussions was expansion of permanent membership without uh, uh, the, the veto power, for example. Uh, so there was this discussion that maybe we should have several uh, members, permanent members, who do not have uh, veto power. Uh, and uh, there was also the alternative suggestion that perhaps we should restrict the veto power of existing countries. Like uh, maybe after they exercise a veto, they need to come to the General Assembly and explain the logic behind why they use the veto power. Is that a more likely chance of that happening? Uh, I, I don't know why. Like if the United States uh, government asked my advice on, I, I would just say just take the memo and shred it and don't even bother to respond. That would be my advice to the US government. But do you think the chances are there that uh, that the pressure to expand can become so much that uh, the permanent members try to diffuse the pressure by trying to restrict the use of the way to power? I think you raised an important question. So let's look at who is using the veto. To be fair, um, the UK and the France have not used a veto for 30 years. Again, because somebody else is do, watching, they're doing their difficult jobs. Yeah. So they haven't used the veto for 30 years and they are perhaps the most open, but their concern is today the veto tomorrow. Why not? Like you raised the question. Why not them? What are they contributing to uh, global peace and security? So that's number one. So those two are not opposed. The other three are taking the position that you have taken. No, not a single change not even a comma, not even a semicolon, no change in the veto. And that's the biggest stumbling block to Security Council reform because for most countries, who becomes a member of the permanent members of Security Council is important, but so is the question of the veto as important for them uh, because uh, they could be at the receiving end of several of these instances. So here's the challenge of veto or non-veto, but I don't see how the permanent members are going to give it up. Now, the thinking was, could the new members be um, provided a via media out of this conundrum? So a suggestion was made that would the new members look at the veto after a 10-year time period where you are permanent, you will be subject to a periodic review 
And after that, if you still make it through the periodic review, you may graduate to the uh, veto earning, um, uh, wielding pass. Uh, that has some support. Um, it's not a fully uh, satisfactory solution to everybody, but that could be, but veto is an end game issue. Uh, and that will only be decided in the end game. Uh, there will be a lot of give and take. So people keep these things up their sleeve. Today, the situation is we are not even the beginning of the beginning game. So the end game issues will not be decided at this stage. Uh, they will be decided if there is a give and take at some stage down the line. So I think for the present, what you have suggested, this is already done. The UN General Assembly has passed a resolution after the vetoes in Ukraine that every time a permanent member vetoes it, they will convene a session in the General Assembly and will uh, have an explanation. But this does not trouble great powers. They will explain their right, uh, view as the Russians have done. Uh, they have repeatedly vetoed and come back and explained and that's it. There's no further issue. So you may gain a little bit a little bit in terms of satisfaction that they've come and explained, but in real terms, it does not make much of a difference. So it's not a big change. You know, if you look at uh, India's role in the international, India has been perhaps one of the better citizens of world politics, uh, right? India has not created problems for other countries. India has not invaded anybody uh, as opposed to, I mean, compared to the record of my country here, <laughs> we, we, I mean, I can't remember when we are not at war directly or indirectly. And uh, and we have often used the UN security, the, the veto in many ways, which are uh, contrary to the rule-based order that our president often talks about, right? Uh, but in the context of uh, the Ukrainian uh, war, Russia's invasion, there was this possibility of expelling Russia. And then we discovered that there is no process in the UN Security Council to expel a member from the, from the permanent five. Uh, this is clearly a, 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 shall we say, a surrender to basically hard power, isn't it? It is just a surrender to hard power. Uh, and do you think that India's growing power and India's capacity to wield influence, like being chairman of G20, chairman of SCO, uh, et cetera, uh, may lead countries like India, Brazil, and others to basically ignore the UN and diminish the very stature of UN Security Council uh, for, for more than two years, I had a photograph of me in UN Security Council saying, I'm at the UNSC where important decisions are never taken. Uh, you know, so, so do you think that this absence of reform means UNSC remains less relevant to contemporary times and so will lose its importance? I entirely agree with you that uh, the UN Security Council has a design flaw. And that design flaw is by choice, not by chance. The idea was that great powers shouldn't be allowed to confront themselves. And therefore, you have this veto for them so that if they are cornered, nobody can push them beyond a certain point. And that's a design flaw that great powers, because you were coming out of a world war and you felt that what was the goal? Not to have another world war. And that has in some way helped because even by if you are cornered as a, one of the permanent members, you would clearly say veto and that's over. The matter at there and they were all happy with this thing. Having said that, the five who are there are not now the five biggest players in the game. And let's also not forget hard power is not a beauty contest. It's a wrestling match. So. Beauty contests are won by people who have different qualities. Wrestling matches are won by people who have different qualities. Now, if that is the difference, like you said, down the line, those who have enough uh, ability will cock a snook if you are not there. And that's what is happening increasingly to the Security Council, that it is now relegated to addressing second order disputes 
second order problems it is not now geared to address the big issues of our time and the only way it can do is to revamp itself so those who have the ability to stall or push reform have a choice to make that choice is either they adjust to new realities accommodate new paths and then have a new table maybe the horseshoe are different but or else Allah, um, certainly increasingly big powers will find their way and solutions whether you like it or you don't like it and the big powers on that table also know they will accommodate them outside and that's what is happening with various other formulations why are new formulations coming up because the formulation which was supposed to address big issues of peace and security is not able to do it uh, uh, why how can the un address climate change security when india has a population of 16 million uh, 1.4 billion and doesn't have a seat on the security council do you think india will ever agree to climate change being discussed in the security council no it's simple so by and by the big issues that matter will move out of the security council it's a call therefore those who are in a position of authority to take do they want to be left with a only a skeletal arrangement uh, or an arrangement which has some muscle and if they need some muscle they have to revamp and you are absolutely right in that india brazil others who are in the game the japanese contribute 13% of the un budget now at continuously if you ignore 13% of the indian uh, union uh, budget it's the same no representation no taxation without representation these yeah. are different forms of the same issue like we say popular uh, mandate they say financial outcome yeah. if the world bank is based on financial basis why are we being totally ignored that's a serious question when countries with 4% let me put it another way the uh, uh, french the british and the russians combined are a little less than what the japanese are paying or about the same now if you were a japanese you would make the same argument so i mean these thing in 1945 japan was not a member of the un it was under the un uh, there is a clause called enemy states yeah japan and germany were enemy states today that clause doesn't exist or doesn't apply so they have a right to make their case whether the case is valid or not is a separate issue it's for uh, everybody to decide but they have a case to make ambassador sahib in the beginning of our discussion you mentioned india's role at, uh, on the apartheid issue and as to how india was a leader on the apartheid issue where do you think india is today when it comes to issues like the palestinian issue the uyghur issue the kurdish issue uh, and so there are other communities who are being victims of basically apartheid Uh, discriminatory treatments uh, is india playing the, the is india a leader on these issues today as it is as it was a leader on the apartheid issue uh, in the 70s and 80s so let's um um try and rewind like I, one, I, i want to also add the rohingyas rohingya uyghurs palestinian sure, sure. so um in its uh, initial phase india was approaching the un as an unbiased institution which would uh, be able to provide justice where justice was uh, denied and therefore decolonization apartheid and many other issues starting from the un declaration of human rights etc however quickly we realized that we are among the few who seem to view it as an impartial body but politics geopolitics hard politics alliance politics plays a role and we quickly realized that today or not today much long ago that it's not a totally impartial body it's a political body and that realization dawned on us very 
maybe in the first decade or so. Therefore, we started recalibrating, saying that if it is a political body, why am I the only one who is uh, taking a position which is totally unbiased looking at it? Having said that, let's take the Palestine issue. And I would suggest that you have a look at the voting at the UN General Assembly year after year. India has never once, once voted against the Palestinians. What does it say? It says that while we have voted many times in favor, sometimes we have abstained. But we have never once voted against the Palestinians on any General Assembly resolution or any Security Council resolution. So what does it say? It says in 75 years or so, if a country has never once voted, it still stands for something. Yes, it balances out its other interests. And um, therefore, it may at times not agree to vote for, but it has never voted against. It abstains sometimes. Uh, we, abstention is by no manner to say it is as good as a negative vote. If that was so, so many others would have voted uh, abstention. Why do they vote negative? Well, for the United States, for example, why is it voting uh, negative if abstention is the same as well? So that's where we are. I, because you took a, a Palestinian issue and it's a good issue to look at in a broader time frame. Now, uh, other issues about uh, the uh, Muslims of the Rakhine state in uh, Myanmar who uh, go by the name of Rohingyas uh, globally, but there are others who use that differently, Burma, etc. and all. But I would like to go by what is the government's approach. I mean, not the Indian governments, but the government which hosts them. So they are called Rakhine state uh, migrants who have moved out of it. Sure, there's a challenge, um, but we are not a party to the refugee convention and for very good reasons we've not been a party to the refugee convention and that is because we when it was done and i must salute those who ever who worked at it in the 50s they said india is newly independent we do not have control over our borders if we allow this they may be our borders are porous then we will not have this um, a belief about what they call non refoulement It is a challenge to us as a country. And we faced that in 1971. Let's not forget that we had 10 million refugees from Bangladesh and India. When Prime Minister Indira Gandhi went all over the world, I remember that. Uh, we were told that you are a country of, at that time, we were about 500 million. 10 million is nothing. India can absorb it. And we said, oh, we are a poor country. How do we manage it? And let's not forget, all individual Indians paid a small cess on petrol. When we went to a film, we paid a small cess on film. When we were posting cards, we posted five paisa more for refugee relief. Nobody in the world helped us with those 10 million. Look at Europe now. It is same population of 500 million, approximately 520 or something million. Yeah. It is much more uh, very well developed, high income compared to what India was in 71. Yet, Europe is struggling to even accommodate 3 million or 4 million refugees or 2 million, whatever it is. Yeah. So just imagine how we did it all without being party to the refugee convention. So if we are not party to the refugee convention, we can't now insist on an approach which is based on the refugee convention because we understand porous borders have a challenge etc so that's the reason why india has abstained consistently on on these issues or voted slightly differently from the rest of the world because on the one hand you see the actual situation on the other hand you see your longer term interest of such issues it's like non-proliferation we are against non-proliferation, but we will never sign the non-proliferation treaty. Come what may, we've proved it many times. We voted against the non-proliferation treaty, not because we are against its goals, but because we are against capping it on a certain date. So uh, there are these uh, nuances that you need to take into account when you do this. Again, with China, um, you said on the Uyghurs issue. 
And let's be again clear, we did not support China on the Uyghur issue. We abstained. There is a reason for that because we have abstained on or uh, never voted for a country specific re um, uh, resolution in the Human Rights Council ever, ever. Um, look at, for example, uh, Canada and the US bring against Iran year after year. India either votes against it or abstains on it. Um, so there is a long standing position because we see that human rights have been used to target nations. So where we don't feel comfortable, we will not vote for it as a matter of principle. And we've even abstained on issues like North Korea, the human rights situation, not because that we are in great sympathy with them, but there is a principle involved in that. So you'll have to look at the principle and appreciate a country which is standing consistently by the principle, even if we alienate some of our best friends at the cost of some others who we may not be very friendly without, with also. So I think there's a consistency in that and we need to appreciate that consistency. Ambassador Saab, uh, it, it is obvious to see why you were such a great ambassador for India, uh, especially at the United Nations. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for being so so and so erudite and to explain to us this nitty gritties of, of the United Nations uh, Security Council reform. And thank you very much for contributing uh, that excellent chapter. I invite all the viewers to read the book. Uh, it is freely available. Uh, I will post a link to the book and separate link to the chapter contributed by Ambassador Syed Akbaruddin. Uh, it is very interesting, especially for people today, uh, as uh, India's uh, international influence uh, is rising. Uh, there is more and more curiosity in India itself as to why India is not considered uh, a, a member of the permanent member of the UN Security Council. So please uh, read the book, read the chapter. Uh, and of course, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, ring the bell icon. Uh, like the video and share it with you. Uh, uh, Ambassador Saab, thank you very much for joining me on Conversations. Uh, uh, and uh, I hope to see you here more often, inshallah. Thank you very much, Dr. Khan. And more power to you and to your ab ability to promote academic dialogue among practitioners, academics, and students. Thank you very much. Thank you.